Back in the 60s, it seemed to come out of nowhere, blasting from your daddy's car radio or the drive-in screen. Those bushy, bushy blonde hairdos, those crew-cut hipsters hanging off mountainous waves. And then it was everywhere. Even farm boy knew what a wipeout was. So where exactly did this crazy thing called surfing really come from? In large part from this man and this board. Here is the legend of Duke Kahanamoku and the board that he rode into history. Duke Kahanamoku was born in 1890. Like many other Hawaiian boys, he had been named for the Duke of Edinburgh, who had visited the islands in 1886. As a teenager, he helped resurrect the ancient Polynesian sport of surfing, which had been suppressed during the colonial period. Kahanamoku and the other surfers of Waikiki Beach were called Beach Boys. But it was in the pool, not the surf, that Kahanamoku first made waves. He broke world records while winning two gold medals in the 1912 Olympics. Duke is often called the first superstar of swimming. After his Olympic triumph in Sweden, he continued to globetrot. Around Christmas Day, 1914, he reached Sydney, Australia. He was here for what they called the Kahanamaku Carnivals, which was, was swimming exhibitions, and he went around the country swimming. But after a while, he was bored with mere swimming. The 25-year-old Duke wanted to surf. Problem was, nobody had ever surfed down under. Although Australia was surrounded by wide beaches with shapely waves, nobody was riding them, unless you counted the sharks. Before steel mesh was placed outside Australian beaches, the waves were crawling with the critters. Since there were no surfers, there were no boards. Not a problem for Duke, who was used to carving his own. Kahanamoku ordered a length of sugar pine from a local hardware store. He then went to work with carving tools and in a few hours had fashioned a serviceable board. It was shaped like a bullet and was about as subtle. It had no fins. It was big, eight and a half feet long, and heavy. Quite amazing, weighs about 65, 70 pounds. It's very heavy, anyone who's ever lifted it would know how heavy it is. On January 15, 1915, he hauled the board out to Freshwater Beach, just north of Sydney. Freshwater seems a spot made for drama, a long tongue of the sea surrounded by high cliffs. In this natural amphitheater, a large crowd had gathered, presumably to watch Duke and his outlandish board being served to the sharks like an appetizer on a cracker. Instead, he splashed into the surf and expertly caught a wave. It was the first time on record that a man stood upright on a board in the Australian surf. Though no photograph exists, the moment was later captured in bronze. In this acclaimed sculpture, perched high on the freshwater cliff, Duke appears to be riding his board on a wave of solid rock. After his first ride, Duke started doing tricks, walking the plank, standing on his head, even taking along a passenger. The astonished and starstruck teenager's name was Isabel Lethem. When we opened the Duke statue some years ago up at the top of the headland here, Isabel was there that day, and she still recalled quite vividly uh, the Duke coming and, and getting her out of the crowd and taking her out on his board and surfing with Isabel up on his shoulders. It was quite remarkable, and Isabel went on to be one of our great champions. Kahanamoku left Australia a surf-mad country brimming with future champions. He also left without his board. Instead of packing it for the trip back to Hawaii, he entrusted it to one of his protégés, 16-year-old Claude West. He and Claude became quite uh, friendly, even though Claude was much younger than the Duke at the time. And he took Claude around on these swimming carnivals with him, but also for some other surfing exhibitions. And at the end of it all, he donated the board. He gave the board to Claude. A worthy recipient, West went on to become the first national surfing champion. And he once saved the Australian Prime Minister's life by pulling him out of some rough surf. West's two passions, surfing and life-saving, were eventually combined on the board. He had his bronze lifesaver's medallion affixed to the wood. West kept the Duke's board for 38 years until 1953, when he donated it to the Freshwater Surf and Lifesaving Club. Three years later, the Duke and his board had a memorable reunion. 
1956, the Duke was invited back to Australia uh, as, as a guest of the Olympic Committee for the 1956 Olympic Games in Melbourne and took the board back out. In, in 1956, took that old big board back out and surfed again. Duke was 66 years old and plagued with the heart trouble that would eventually claim his life. But he could still surf. Since Kahanamoku's first visit in 1914, Australia has become one of the surfing capitals of the world, even rivaling the Duke's own home water of Hawaii. Every Australian kid who lives on the eastern seaboard wants to surf. You know, if we've got a population of, of 18 million, you'd, you'd have to think we've got six million surfers. You can trace it back to one January morning in 1915, and to one board hewn from a solid piece of sugar pine. Duke Kahanamoku's Australian surfboard is on display at the Freshwater Surf and Lifesaving Club in Sydney, Australia.